So today we're going to be looking at um, different ways of doing autofocus with a camera. So when you're taking a, a photo with any kind of camera really, so a lot of phones or definitely things like SLRs like this, you might see an autofocus mechanism. So here we've got MF for manual focus and AF for autofocus. So if we've got it set on autofocus, um, essentially the camera and these days the computer inside the camera decides whether a picture is, is blurry or not and, and corrects that by moving the lens. So we're going to look at a few of the, uh, the methods you can do that. Okay, so let's start uh, back in the day. So the first kinds of um, focus assist, I suppose you could call it. So back in the sort of around about the 1930s, there was something called rangefinder cameras came out. These are cameras that have a sort of extra separate mechanism on the side of them, which was the rangefinder mechanism. Now this was all done with optics and the way it works is you basically see a viewpoint of what you're looking at and then you get a kind of like a ghost image that's shifted to one side normally. What you have to do is change a dial on the rangefinder mechanism to bring the two images um, kind of lying on top of each other. So these days, uh, it's all kind of joined into the imaging system. So generally speaking, there's two different ways you can do autofocus. Um, there's active methods and there's passive methods. So an active method will fire something out from the camera and it will um, use that to work out how far away something is. So uh, some of the most, um, some of the earliest mechanisms for doing active uh, autofocus used something a bit like sonar. So it would send out a ping from the camera and it would basically time how long it took to hit something and bounce back just like the way sonar works. And it would use that to work out a distance that you could then use to focus it. Um, so you can use sound, you can also use light. So some active systems will fire out uh, light from the camera. What we're actually going to concentrate on today is the passive approaches. How do we actually um, focus a camera um, when we're not sending out light or sound? So we're just using um, the light that's coming into the lens to do the focusing. One of the most popular passive mechanisms of autofocus is something called phase detection. So you might be aware of phase detection systems. On your camera, you might have different autofocus points, different areas of an image that you can choose to focus on. Let's have a look at how phase detection works in each one of those regions. With a phase detection system, if this is our lens coming into the camera, what we do is we essentially measure how um, light behaves at different points on the lens. So if we have a ray coming from here, and we sort of follow it through. So I'm not going to draw all the complicated optics here. Your light rays that go through the lens fall upon an autofocus sensor. So this is really essentially a sort of 1D strip of photodiodes, so a set of pixels essentially. It's like a little image sensor that the light hits here. Now the trick behind phase detection is you measure two paths of light. So you would actually have a second sensor. So this second light ray here actually hits a, a different sensor. Imagine behind the scenes that this is separated via optics, but just to kind of simplify things, let's draw what's happening here. So what we get hitting this set of pixels, if you like, is we get to see one of the image features in the image. So if we've got a very simple image, what we might have here is a little peak. So perhaps the edge of something at one of those detection points. And because in this case the image is well focused, these two curves will overlay. If you imagine our two images hitting our autofocus sensor and they're perfectly aligned. In the case where the image isn't in focus, what happens is these beams go through the pixels like this and they actually focus just behind the pixels. So what that means is if we draw our curves, we have one peak that's kind of up here like this and we have another peak that's a little bit below like this because we're not in focus. So the nice thing about phase detection is that what you do is you measure the offset of these two peaks and the distance between them tells you how out of focus they are. So let's just draw the last case where, so this one is kind of focused past the sensor and the other way that you can be focused is in front of the sensor. So we have light coming up here and perhaps doing something like that. So our focus point is here. So when it hits the autofocus sensors, they're going to be offset again. So the two sensors will give a reading of one kind of curve up here and one curve down here. Not drawn very well. 
okay and then we get another distance out what these sensors do so remember in reality there's probably two of these inside the, the system that the light's hitting this is a very simple image that we're making here in practice the two curves might be quite complicated you know they, they might be different features that we see they're not just going to be a straight peak most of the time it'll be some kind of pattern of light that's hitting these sensors and so the job of the um, phase detection mechanism is to work out how to move one of these curves so that it lines up with the other one. So mathematically you can do something called cross correlation there which is a way of essentially looking at how to best match two signals that are offset from each other. And what that gives you is a distance and it's that distance that phase detection uses to drive the lens. So the nice thing about phase detection is that once it's calculated this distance it's very fast to focus because not only does it know it's out of focus but it knows by how much. So once it's calculated this difference, it can say to the, to the mechanism driving the focus lens, okay, move this much in this direction. So we've got a distance, but we also know whether we're focused too far away or focused too close, because if you notice here, the red peak here is above the green peak when we're focused behind, and here the green peak is above the red peak when we're focused in front. By knowing which way to shift these patterns it knows how far to move the lens and which direction so phase detection tends to be one of the quickest ways to focus a camera do most systems use this kind of thing or do most is so a lot of systems will use both so a lot of slrs will use both and the reason is when you're focusing through the viewfinder it tends to use phase detection because it's using the optics of the the lens system to steal a bit of the light and pass it to these sort of pairs of autofocus sensors. So you get to one pair for each autofocus region. Um, but you can only do that when you're looking through the viewfinder. If you open the live view, so that changes how the optics in the camera works. And so then it will tend to use a process called contrast detection, which we'll look at now. Now, contrast detection does work on light that's hitting the imaging sensor. So we're not using the optics in here to divert light around to the autofocus sensors. This is just using the sensor that is essentially used to capture the final image. What we're going to be doing is uh, reading off some values of those pixels that make up your image. And one of the things, one of the properties about focus is that the contrast of the image, so sort of the differences between the, the bright bits and the dark bits, get more extreme the more in focus you are. So when you have nice crisp focus, you get nice clear differences between black areas and white areas. Um, so what that means is if we have a way of calculating those differences, so how kind of sharp our edges are and our corners are, and how different our regions of light and dark are, so we can measure our contrast, we can kind of work out how in focus we are. So if we just work through how we would do that using a really simple example, um, we can look at some other kind of gotchas that happen on the way and think about why it's quite slow to do this as well. So we've got a photograph here which I've just turned black and white because it just makes the processing a bit simpler. So we're just using a tool here called ImageJ which allows us to do some pretty simple scripting just to get at pixel values and to blur the images as well. You can just download this and try stuff out. What's going on here is we can get at the values of the pixels and in order to work out how much contrast we have in the image, probably the very simplest thing we can do is just look at pairs of pixels and calculate the difference between them in terms of brightness. So if we just go through an image, a pair of pixels at a time and calculate the difference between them, when we kind of maximize that, the total of all those differences, then we're in pretty good focus because we've got the most contrast we can have. So that's what this simple example here will do. And this line here is just calculating the difference between them. So I'm just calculating differences in the X direction, so in the row along here. Sometimes, and this is true with phase detection as well, your calculations of contrast or phase can either be sort of in the X direction along the rows or along the columns or you can get sort of cross sensors that do both in phase detection. In the contrast here, we're just going to do uh, neighboring X pixels, okay? So we could calculate all the neighboring Y pixels as well, but just to keep it simple, I'm doing this. We could use probably a better measure of contrast, so something like a Sabell operator um, or something else that's good for detecting edges. 
Um, but just as a very simple example, let's just measure the difference between neighboring pixels and see how that changes as we go out of focus, which I'll simulate by blurring the image. So if I run this, it will move over the image and it takes a little while because I'm moving across all the pixels. Uh, we get a number here, which is essentially the total of all those differences between the pairs of pixels. So um, it doesn't really matter absolutely what the number is. What we're going to do is try and find the peak okay, of these, these values. So actually, we're starting off in focus here, and we've got a value of about 5 million. Let's make it a little bit out of focus. So if we apply a Gaussian blur, so I don't know whether you can see there, but it's gone a bit out of focus there. You can see we've lost our crisp edges. So if I run this again, being a little bit out of focus, it's taking a little while to go over it. So our first value was 5.1 million we've now got a value of 1.2 million. So we've gone from 5 million down to 1 million as the total of our differences. So we've gone a bit out of focus and we've got a lower um, contrast value, if you like. So let's take it to the extreme case, terribly out of focus image. <laughs> Looks like my camera work. Right, no comment. So run it again, and there we are. So now we've gone from 1.2 million down to 145,000. And if we take it to the extreme, the real extreme case, we're gonna get very low values coming out here. So what's happening, if we have an algorithm that does this, is that we can plot these values on a curve. So if this is our focus motor driving the lens, and this is our measure of contrast, which in this case is just differences in pairs of pixels, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get some kind of curve like this, so when we're out of focus either way, the value is going to drop down like it does there. And when we're in focus, we're kind of at this peak point here. So the trick with contrast detection is finding this peak. With my camera operator head on and looking at the shot I'm looking at now, I've got the laptop quite close to me. Yep. I've got you in the middle and I've got the blinds at the back. Yep. And uh, experience tells me that autofocus will look at those blinds and go, hey, they're nice, they're going to look great if they're mm -hmm. sharp and you're going to be blurry in your face. Yeah, so that can be a problem. If you're running this over a whole image, you're going to get issues. So quite often, um, for example, on, on your phone, you can, you can essentially select a region to focus on. So you can press a region on your phone or you can select a, a focus point on Live View or something like that. What that will do is it will only calculate this difference across a particular region of an image. So if we just want to focus on the library here, we can just calculate this over there. Otherwise, you're right, it's going to end up kind of optimizing this curve for something in the image that you might not care about. The shiny stuff. Usually. The shiny stuff. <laughs> and of course, the other thing to say, I suppose, is we've gone through every pixel in the image here, but actually you would probably only sort of subsample the image in order to make it quicker. You might have noticed it took a little while to work. These methods tend to be quite slow. They're not as slow as this because they're not calculating every single pixel. You don't generally need to. But the catch with this method is that you can tell um, you're out of focus. So when we were out of focus at sort of 1.2 million on our count, sort of down here, if this is 5 million where we were to start with, and then the first time we blurred it, we went down to 1.2 million, we know we're here, but we don't know whether we're there or there. So we don't know which way to move the lens. You'll notice when cameras use this as a hunting mechanism. So it has to move the lens a little bit and work out whether it's got better or worse. So it will tend to move it in quite big jumps like this. And as soon as it starts getting worse, it will kind of hunt back. So you get these steps moving up the curve to try and find the sort of optimal focus point up here. So you need to search. So that's one of the reasons why uh, contrast detection is pretty slow. Unlike phase detection where it says, uh, move this much in this direction, move the lens this much in this direction to focus, with contrast detection, you don't get that. You just say, I'm out of focus, but I don't know whether I'm too far away or too close. The other reason why this method can fail is if it doesn't have anything to measure contrast on to start with. So you need some kind of texture. So if you're trying to focus on the sky region, for example, up here, you can imagine that even, you know, the more and more I blur the sky, it's not having that much effect on the focus. Um, that's pretty true of the phase detection as well. So if you've got no edges visible, it's very hard to do that pattern matching to work out where you need to move. Sometimes you, you'll see things like these charts which provide a nice contrast between black and white edges that used to assist 
uh, the camera focus, focusing mechanism. And the nice thing about the calibration charts like this is that they have very good contrast, um, bright areas and dark areas that make focusing nice and easy. So as an example, let's try perhaps focusing on this and taking some out of focus images and we can see how the contrast focusing mechanism performs as we go in and out of focus. Put nice. It, I'll put it on autofocus, let's see. Okay. So you might notice with your cameras that both of these mechanisms will um, fail to work very well when you haven't got much texture. So if you're pointing just at the white wall there, it's going to struggle to find focus. And low light. Low light is a problem, so you often get an assist beam. So some cameras will use a flash to light up the scene so that it can see what it's doing. Some will send out, um, uh, it, they'll have a little extra bulb that they light up the scene with. Um, which could be done in infrared, so you can't see it, and then it could focus in infrared. Um, but yes, you get that problem as well. Uh, some systems will even project out some kind of structured light, so like a grid of light or a texture of light, just to help these algorithms focus a bit better. Um, so one advantage of the, of the active methods is, of course, they'll focus in complete darkness, because if you're using sonar, it will bounce back off the wall, whether it's lit up or not. Um, the disadvantage being it will bounce back from a window as well, so you can't take photos through glass and things like that. So it kind of swings and roundabouts with all these different mechanisms. To kind of summarise the last two methods that we've talked about, the phase detection is nice and quick, but it needs its own optics to work. Um, the contrast detection works without fancy optics, and it works on a live view where you can just see the image, um, but it's a bit slower because you have to do this hunting approach. So, um, wouldn't it be nice if we could do some kind of phase detection, but on the actual image sensor? And so there's some technologies coming along now, so things like dual pixel focusing, where what they've tried to do is essentially bury these um, autofocus points throughout the sensor. So I think it's Canon that do this approach. I don't know whether there's other approaches available. And the way it works, essentially each pixel is comprised of two photodiodes. So they kind of work in pairs, and each one of the photodiodes um, has some kind of micro lens attached to it. You've got optics going on, but it's spread out across the sensor. And each one of these pairs of photodiodes is used to do um, phase detection focusing. So it works on the, on the back main image sensor, the same one that's used to capture the image. So you use the pair of uh, photodiodes, hence dual pixel, uh, to do the, essentially it's like, Phase, different, uh, phase detection focusing. But when you want to take the picture, both of the photodiodes will work together to act as a pixel to take the picture. So the nice thing about that is it's still working on the back plane. So when you're looking at the LCD panel, it's still doing um, phase detection. So it's, it's nice and fast. This is called the aperture problem or the barbershop pole illusion because it's got stripes moving up and down. And the idea being that there's not enough information here to, um, to accurately... Plus your row times 100 plus your x times 1, and that will give you the exact point in memory, linear memory.